So let's consider now other nutrient deficiencies that are prevalent in the U.S. and also internationally. So I want to begin with a talk on vitamin K, also known chemically as philoquinone. Now the food sources are interesting. There are really three, ma two major food sources and one non-food source. So the food sources may basically green leafy greens, turnip greens, broccoli, kale, collar, um, spinach, various oils, olive oil, canola oil, soybean oil. So these are the limited um, foods that have this particular nutrient. So in our current context of a population eating very few leafy greens, and of course avoiding all things that are oil so we're in our fat-free phase so all the diets encourage fat-free products of various types uh, we have the making of a potential uh, dangerous storm notably uh, the lack of greens and the lack of oil that are healthy of course uh, that contain vitamin k so this leaves us one line of defense and that's the gut bacteria uh, that naturally produce some amount of vitamin K, enough to um, prevent a deficiency. I want to provide you with a very good list of the top 10 vitamin K rich foods. And at the top, um, fermented soybean, about three ounces of natto, also fermented soybean, will basically give you over a thousand percent of your daily value. Next, collard greens, half a cup, 662%. Turnip greens, 532%. So you can see where these rich um, sources of vitamin K are coming from, essentially um, the greens. Uh, spinach, 181%. Uh, kale, 141%. And broccoli, 138%. We can see a little lower the vegetable oil, one tablespoon, providing 31% uh, of the DV or 25 micrograms. So I invite students to memorize at least the top five um, vitamin K rich foods. Vitamin K or philoquinone has two main functions, blood coagulation. So indeed, vitamin K is an, uh, an interesting and significant component in helping the blood uh, coagulate. So in the um, instance, for example, of taking anticoagulant uh, medication, uh, it's important to restrict uh, vitamin K. Then the second function of vitamin K is the synthesis of key proteins in bone formation. So the main sources, plants, and if you remember, dark green are very, um, very important sources. Vegetable oil, such as olive and canola and soy are very good sources. And then, of course, the intestinal bacteria. Now, when an individual takes broad-spectrum antibiotics over a chronic period of time, uh, it essentially eliminates a lot of the uh, good uh, pathogen or the good bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, leaving room for more nefarious pathogens. And so after um, a bacterial treatment, after uh, antibiotic treatment, it's important to recolonize the microbiome with uh, perhaps something like kefir, which has a broad assortment of rich bacteria that can re-element that microbiome and put you back on a healthy recovery. So let's take a step back and, and take a broader look at vitamin K deficiency. First of all, it rarely is seen in the adult population, but there are instances where it can occur with antibiotic therapy. What basically happens is that the antibiotic kills uh, the intestinal bacteria that synthesizes the vitamin K. And this is especially the case with broad spectrum antibiotics. So prolonged antibiotic therapy can therefore increase the risk of vitamin K deficiency, uh, especially when the diet is poor in vegetable oil and vegetable greens. We also know that newborn infants don't have vitamin K producing bacteria in the intestine. Therefore, that leads them uh, to a high risk of sudden hemorrhage, for example. So then, uh, as a precaution in all US hospitals and Canadian hospitals, vitamin K injections are given right at birth. 
The next nutrient deficiency I'd like to look at is folate deficiency. Folate deficiency is nicely described in more detail in your textbook, so I encourage you to read more about it. Um, I'm going to go over the highlights. Before we get into deficiencies, let's take a look at where folate is found in foods. This particular slide illustrates it very well. It's richly and naturally found in fruits and in vegetables. And then with the fortification of the food supply, we see it also in grains, thus the breakfast cereals that we see here. Here's a more formal listing of foods that are elevated in folate from the uh, NIH's Office of Dietary Supplements. So we can see right at the top we have beef liver which contains 54 percent of the daily value so quite significant. But what I want to point out is that with the fortification of our food supply containing folate we have really two significant sources of folate. Those from the natural sources that provide inactive folate and those from the um, uh, breads and cereal group that contain fortified folate. So for example, the spinach, the black-eyed peas, uh, the asparagus, the Brussels sprouts, lettuce, avocado, spinach, and broccoli, all are natural sources of folate and they are biochemically inactive in the body. And we'll see a little bit later on what that actually means. The other sources are the uh, breads and cereals. So what we have for cereal products are the breakfast cereals, the rice, and the spaghetti. And these contain an active form of uh, folate, which is folic acid, which becomes biologically active in the body, and we'll see what that actually implies later on. For now, it's good to memorize the top five um, foods that are elevated in folate. Now let's take a look at the main deficiencies um, and diseases that are associated with suboptimal intake of folate. First, neural tube defects in newborn, um, megaloblastic anemia, which is really a large red blood cell anemia, and the risk of heart disease. Indeed, when folate levels are suboptimal in the population, uh, it is uh, usually associated with higher risks of heart disease in certain parts of the population. Now, in terms of function, it's directly related to DNA duplication, favoring, therefore, the replication of red blood cells and digestive cells, so the cells lining the intestine. So when there's a compromised folate status, uh, the ability to actually absorb nutrients gets seriously compromised. We know that in uh, mothers who are yeah, fully deficient, and even um, women of childbearing years who are fully deficient, when they become pregnant, they have a higher percent chance of developing um, uh, fetuses and babies that have neural tube defects. So what we see on this image here are children with uh, spina bifida, which is a neural tube defect in which the spine does not properly close, leaving the child um, oftentimes paraplegic. There was a campaign in the United States to overcome uh, this problem by encouraging women to eat five a day fruit and vegetables. Uh, it was a campaign uh, based on the understanding that the lack of fruit and vegetable consumption in the population, notably uh, the population of women of childbearing years, was actually leading to a higher prevalence of neural tube defects among newborns, uh, much higher than our counterpart in Europe. Uh, so the five-a-day program was set up with that as an intent, uh, but found um, as a result that fruit and vegetables of good quality didn't actually get increased in the population. In fact, it declined. Uh, so the solution to overcome this problem uh, quite significantly was to fortify the food supply with folic acid, an active form of folate, um, and so consequently we see folate added to breads and cereals uh, and uh, you know all kinds of uh, cereal products like spaghetti and rice and so forth and this was a public health effort to overcome the problem of uh, neural tube defects that was much higher in prevalence than it should have been. Folate is also important in the prevention of a certain type of anemia. It's called megaloblastic anemia, megalo meaning larger than life red blood cells. 
um, blastic. So it's an anemia that is very different than the iron deficiency anemia, which is microcytic, small red blood cell. This particular deficiency has large red blood cells, or in other words, megaloblastic. The top cells of this particular graph demonstrate the normal mitotic division of red blood cells. The cell, uh, you can see with the DNA in the center, uh, progresses in which then there is a mitotic beginning of the, um, of the division of the cell which uh, has the DNA migrating to each of the different poles followed then by um, a subsequent uh, division of the cell producing two smaller uh, red blood cells. Now this is the normal process and what you need to know is that DNA is an intricate part of this DNA division. When we look at the bottom, we're looking at an example of a cell that does not have a folate. Consequently, the ability uh, for the DNA to separate and migrate to the different poles doesn't occur. So what we see is the cell growing in size, but not able to undergo a mitotic division to the point where it reaches a megaloblastic form or a larger than life red blood cell, which with no ability to divide. So this contrasts with the smaller red blood cells that we see dividing in a normal mitotic division where folate is present. So when a hematologist is looking at the blood smear, he is seeing larger numbers of large red blood cells relative to uh, the smaller red blood cells and concludes that there is First, that it is macrocytosis. Microcytosis just basically means a large red blood cell. And this is an important observation because there are many reasons for a large red blood cell. But if the physician concludes that it's related to a folate deficiency, then it goes from macrocytosis to megaloblastosis. So in this reaction, I'm showing you methyl tetrahydrofolate, which is the inactive form of folate found in the vegetables, the broccoli, the different fruits that we eat. And it demonstrates that we need B12 in order to activate um, the folate uh, through demethylation, removing the methyl group and creating a tetrahydrofolate, which is the active form. And it's in this active form that folate then can get involved in DNA duplication. So this equation demonstrates that a folate deficiency can occur because primarily there's, a not, there's not enough of folate in the diet, uh, but it can also occur because there's no B12 there to convert it to its active form. So that too can create a megaloblastic anemia. So megaloblastic anemia can occur from a lack of folate and, uh, or from a lack of B12. Now, additionally, we can say that the fortification of cereal products in our current uh, food inventory with folic acid, which is an active form of folate, uh, can mask a B12 deficiency. Well, what does this mean? Well, it means that in the presence of folic acid, which is active, B12 is no longer necessary. So this means a physician, therefore, um, looking or depending on megaloblastosis to be able to ask the question, I wonder if this is a folate deficiency or a B12 uh, deficiency, can no longer really ponder that reality because with folic acid supplementation, there's lack of megaloblastosis. Therefore, camouflaging or hiding B12 deficiency, which leads to neurological degeneration or pernicious anemia. Folate deficiency is also found internationally, most prominent in countries like India and Chile, where their diets are based on wheat or maize or rice. And unfortunately, in these countries, the, the wheat, maize, and rice is unfortified, meaning that folate in the form of folic acid, which is an active form of folate, uh, is not added back into the wheat supply. This is also likely because there are pockets of the populations in these countries that don't consume uh, a wide variety of uh, fruits and vegetables that would actually provide them with uh, folate. So consequently, we have a problem in these countries because of a lack of fortification of their wheat. 
Additionally, we can conclude that in these countries where there's difficult access to meat, um, where uh, B12 is essentially and exclusively found, we can say that this folate deficiency is compounded by this because of the fact that there is very little B12 coming in, uh, which is exclusively, again, found in animal products. So if there's a lack of animal products, there's a lack of B12. And if this is a chronic problem that goes over decades, then what happens is that this B12 deficiency leads to a folate deficiency also. So to make things very clear, the fortification programs around the world use active folate, which is folic acid, which means that it doesn't need B12 to be activated. So consequently, a fortification program would basically take care of the problem of lack of protein in that nation and getting the population this active folate in the form of folic acid. So what we're seeing here is because there is um, a lack of fortification in these particular countries, uh, obviously the lack of meat uh, problem is not resolved. Now I want to explore B vitamin and C uh, deficiencies. Vitamin B12 specifically, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, and pyridoxin. The very distinct characteristic of vitamin B12, otherwise known as cobalamin, uh, are its food sources. It is essentially a nutrient found uniquely in animal foods, the meats, the dairy, the eggs, uh, so it becomes a vitamin, historically, that was at risk uh, in vegetarianism, uh, notably vegans, for example, that don't consume any milk or, or any eggs. Uh, it's not been such a problem as of late because of the fortification of B12 in a lot of soy milks, rice milks, uh, almond milks, for instance. So in this case, in the modern age, we don't really worry about it too much, but historically, it was a problem. I'm providing you now with the top 10 foods that are richest in vitamin B12. You can see at the top uh, the clams at 1,400% of the DV, and then l beef liver, very, very elevated, close to 1,200% of the DV. Um, then we get down to breakfast cereals, and the breakfast cereals are at 100% of the daily value, and this is because they've been fortified, that is, added back, uh, or added to cereals. But you can see otherwise that um, vitamin B12 is found in trout and salmon, uh, tuna, and various meats, uh, and various other types of breakfast cereals as well. So again, as in other vitamins and minerals, memorize the top five sources of vitamin B12. Again, I want to reiterate that relationship we saw in previous slides regarding folate, for instance. And again, that intimate relationship between um, inactive folate and its active form, thus requiring B12, if you remember, to activate uh, methyl tetrahydrofolate to its active form, uh, tetrahydrofolate. Now, in a diet where there is lack of meat, there is B12 deficiency. There is no B12 there to activate the um, inactive folate, thereby resulting in outright folate deficiencies, notably the large red blood cells, megaloblastic anemia, difficulty in growing, for example, and um, also uh, neural tube defects, if you remember, and difficulty absorbing. So it's all very interrelated. So whenever a diet is low in meats and especially low in vegetables, you know that B12 and folate uh, are going to be compromised. So this relationship, as previously mentioned, um, gives a good example of how it is that in countries like India and Chile, that there's a folate deficiency uh, due to the fact that they're not actually fortifying their cereal products in those countries. Indeed, it's the absence of protein of good quality, uh, notably uh, protein of high biological value, animal proteins. In that context, the lack of B12 uh, absolutely affects the availability 
of folate in the diet in its active form leading to folate deficiency. Now B12 deficiency um, has been notably prevalent again as I mentioned in Indian society so Indian adults but also in Kenyan school children and how's it diagnosed well it's diagnosed when the serum levels of B12 are less than 150 picomoles per liter now the causes oftentimes are a compromised intrinsic factor secretion the intrinsic factor is secreted from the parietal cells of the stomach and is used specifically in the absorption of B12 later on in the ileum. Now, if you remember in the gastrointestinal lecture, we talked about Helicobacter pylori as being uh, one of the main causes of peptic ulcers. And the Helicobacter pylori has more recently been associated uh, with a B12 deficiency because of its effect on creating a gastritis of the inner lining of the stomach which affects uh, the secretion or uh, the integrity should we say of the secreting glands within uh, the stomach notably the HCL and also specifically the secretion of intrinsic factor so so in that sense helicobacter pylori could be responsible for less IF secretion which as noted earlier is responsible for the actual absorption of B12 later on in the ileum. Uh, there's also instances of atrophic gastritis or achloridia which is a loss of hydrochloric acid secretion from the parietal, parietal cells and also the secretion of IF or intrinsic factor from the parietal cells. So parietal cells are secreting both the HI, HCL and the IF. So in atrophic gastritis or achloridia, which happens in adults over the age of 50, part of the aging process, there is indeed a little less availability of intrinsic factor that's present. But in addition, I must outline the fact that in the absence of uh, um, hydrochloric acid or I should say of a diminished hydrochloric acid there is less shall we say uh, breaking down of the protein through the acids so the meats and and uh, meat like products that contain protein are not as well broken down and that also means less of a release of B12 from the protein matter in the stomach so we have two factors going on less intrinsic factor which compromises the absorption later on in the ileum and there's less hydrochloric acid which um, diminishes the availability of uh, B12 being released from the protein foods in the stomach so this goes on with age we also have vegetarians vegans specifically who tend to have low serum B12 uh, but is not a reality that necessarily has to affect vegans nowadays because vegans now have access to things like soy milk and rice milk and almond milk that are all enriched with b12 and then of course we have gastric bypass surgery which is the last factor and gastric bypass surgery really bypasses in many instances a lot of the hydrochloric acid uh, parietal cells in other words and also bypasses the um, the parietal cells for the release of intrinsic factor so in gastric bypass surgery we see um, a diminished availability of IF and HCL uh, which then compromises the availability and the absorption of um, B12 later on in the ileum now I want to take a closer look just as a review of how absorption of B12 is influenced. First, we have to understand that the parietal cells are very important in two ways. Uh, first, the um, uh, intrinsic factor that actually gets secreted is important in ensuring the absorption of B12 later on in the ileum. Um, and the parietal cell also uh, secretes stomach acid HCL and that HCL is important in also breaking down the protein to allow the release of B12 from the actual meat and protein sources again the idea is that the absorption then again of the um, of the B12 is in the ileum and it's helped by the intrinsic factor 
Now I want to distinctly look at uh, cobalamin or B12 deficiencies. Um, the deficiency of B12, independent of folate, of course, has clear neurological manifestation. There is also a manifestation uh, in the form of anemia, uh, but when it's uh, strictly uh, only a B12 deficiency, uh, we talk about an anemia uh, that is pernicious. Pernicious is another word for nasty. It's an anemia that has clear um, uh, bad repercussions leading to neurological degeneration and eventually death. Now we also know that because of B12's relationship uh, with folate that a B12 deficiency can also be uh, megaloblastic anemia as a symptom as well. So in other words two types of anemias can come out of a B12 deficiency. The neurological uh, pernicious anemia, which takes many years, by the way, because of how um, the body recycles uh, B12 in the absorption process through what we call the enterohepatic circulation. So it literally takes 15 years for a true uh, B12 deficiency to take place uh, if there is no um, uh, B12 in the diet. So consequently, this pernicious anemia, this, uh, neuro, these neurological defects um, really start to kick in many, many years later after the deficiency has actually started. So the second type of anemia is the megaloblastic anemia, and the megaloblastic anemia is what we uh, see with folate deficiency, which is the large red blood cell. So now the question is, who is susceptible to this? Well, first, adults over the age of 50 are subject to achloridia, or a lack of hydrochloric acid production in the stomach. And this means um, an improper or incomplete digestion of the protein sources, the meats notably in the stomach, leading to less availability or less release, if you will, of B12 from the food. So this can actually lead to a little bit of a problem. Now in adults also, there's less secretion from the parietal cells of intrinsic factor. So it means of the little B12 that gets released from the food, little is absorbed in the, B, in the ileum as well. Noted as well, gastric bypass surgery, because of the fact that a significant uh, amount of the stomach is um, bypassed, um, what is bypassed are essentially the parietal cells in quite a significant way, leading to less acid and again less uh, intrinsic factor. Uh, pure vegans historically have been subject to B12 deficiency, and this is because of the absence uh, of actual uh, animal products, which are really the only sources of B12. So um, that's historically been a problem, but it's less recognized of a problem now because of the fortification of the food supply, notably wheat products, with B12. Well then, finally, in inflammatory bowel disease, there's sometimes a need to do partial or complete resections of the ileum. And so whenever a partial or complete uh, ileum removal uh, is part of the protocol, uh, invariably that leads to a B12 deficiency as well. One thing that makes vitamin B12 deficiency so difficult to attain is the fact that there is a very efficient uh, enterohepatic circulation that ensures a reabsorption if you will, of B12 back into the system. So in other words, we tend to excrete very little B12 in our fecal material. The enterohepatic circulation is nicely represented here on this particular slide that you're now viewing. And what you can see is uh, that the reabsorption of bile around the ileum ensures a return of the bile via the hepatic uh, portal vein back to the liver where it then gets um, uh, resynthesized, if you will, into bile, then resecreted into the duodenum. But what happens essentially is that B12 gets reabsorbed along with the bile uh, at the ileum level. This is a such a an efficient reabsorption process, if you will, that only 
5% uh, of the bile that actually gets initially uh, secreted uh, gets excreted in the fecal material. So up to 95% gets reabsorbed into the system. Uh, this particular slide illustrates how the B12 is reabsorbed through portal circulation uh, back to the liver and then re-secreted again back out into the gastrointestinal tract by the bile duct. So there's a recirculation of the B12 uh, that makes it, that it is very, very efficiently utilized, thus explaining why it would take 10 to 15 years for a deficiency to take place after um, a suboptimal uh, access to B12. The next uh, nutrient that I'd like to look at is thiamine. And these are the main food sources, pork and organ meats, legumes, sunflower seeds, breakfast cereals, enriched uh, breads and grains. The most recognizable deficiency disease from thiamine is called beriberi. The first clinical description of beriberi was by the Dutch physicians Bonchus in 1642 and Nicholas Talp in 1652. Now, Talp treated a young Dutchman who was brought back to Holland from the East Indies, suffering from what the natives of the Indies called beriberi or the lameness. Now, the treatment was unsuccessful. Talp's description of beriberi, however, was very detailed, but he had no clue back then that it was a dietary deficiency. This discovery came more than 200 years later. Talp's description of the disease beriberi was well documented in his uh, classic book on the observations medica uh, back in the 17th century. Now, the first breakthroughs in the true understanding of beriberi wasn't until the 19th century. Uh, this came with um, the observations in 1880 when Dr. K. Takaki, um, at the time the Director General of the Japanese um, Naval Services, noticed a correlation between the diet of sailors and the actual incidence and prevalence of beriberi. He had observed that when individuals were eating a complete, well-balanced diet, that the incidence of beriberi was very low. So Takaki ordered an increase of vegetables, barley, fish, and meat um, at the expense of the overbearing amount of rice um, that was taking part, uh, being part of the daily ration. And that rice that was being served, of course, was essentially refined rice, white rice. So the occurrence or the surge in beriberi in the 19th century was truly in the wake of the Industrial Revolution that basically ended up creating a lot of this processed food and notably uh, processed rice in this case. Once the complete and well-balanced diet for the, um, uh, for the sailors was implemented, uh, the Japanese Navy saw the incidence of beriberi drop from 40% right down to 0% in six years. Back in the West Indies, the Dutch medical officer, Dr. Christian Eichmann, believed it was a microbial infection, and he began investigating beriberi at a military hospital in Batavia, Java, in the Dutch East Indies, now Jakarta, Indonesia, in roughly around 1886. Eichmann used an animal model of chickens and found that chickens that were fed white, polished, or milled rice developed the polyneuritis, which resembled beriberi, whereas the red, partially polished rice, the unhusked rice, or brown rice, and rice hulls prevented and even cured the disease. Eichmann and his colleague, Dr. Garrett Grinch, showed that there was an anti-polyneuritic factor that could be extracted from the rice hulls with water or ethanol, discovering that in the hulls itself, uh, which is usually discarded when they actually create polished or white rice, uh, contained a factor that was curative of the disease. 
So the component found in the extraction was essentially thiamine. And so in the 20th century, with the enrichment of wheat and rice, the disease beriberi virtually vanished. Here's a list of the top thiamine rich foods and I encourage students to memorize the top five. Here we've got um, breakfast cereals of course and rice and egg noodles all of which have been enriched with thiamine because the food processing the mechan mechanized milling of course robs the wheat of all the nutrients so it's um, generally advised to enrich these foods that is to add back thiamine uh, notably as well as other nutrients. Um, after the milling process uh, in order to ensure population health. But we can see as well that pork and trout and black beans are also really good sources uh, of this particular uh, vitamin. Now the deficiency disease of beriberi is no longer found in the Western nations, but it still can be found in Asia and African nations, notably Ethiopia, Guinea, Nepal, and Thailand. Now the causes of deficiencies can be due to a diet relying too much on processed wheat and rice that isn't enriched. And of course there's also alcohol excess, notably alcoholics are well known for having a particular thiamine deficiency called Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, typically visible among individuals that can't remember um, the um, alcohol binge from the night before, for instance. So the Korsakoff syndrome is a clear loss of uh, particular memory. There's also a little bad news for sushi lovers. Indeed, uh, abundant raw fish consumption uh, can also lead to thiamine deficiency. And this is because the raw fish contain an enzyme called thiaminase, which is a thiamine antagonist, so it prevents the absorption of thiamine. Now, diagnosing a thiamine deficiency is rather difficult. Certainly by doing dietary recalls, you can get a sense if thiamine is low in the diet, but usually blood values don't really um, represent an accurate way of doing it. However, in the case of thiamine, uh, there are two uh, measurements. Thiamine pyrophosphate uh, is one measurement, and then thiamine transketolase, which is an enzyme uh, reflecting uh, thiamine status as well, and regarded uh, fairly, uh, as a fairly accurate measure. Now a primary deficiency of thiamine basically means that the deficiency disease occurs primarily because people are not eating enough of the vitamin. And this particularly happens in people subsisting on highly polished rice that is really unenriched. So the milling removes the husk which contains most of the thiamine. Therefore it's necessary then to enrich uh, the refined rice in order to ensure population health. But uh, boiling before husking uh, disperses actually the vitamin throughout the grain and thus prevents its complete loss. Now by contrast, a secondary thiamine deficiency is really related to problems of absorption as opposed to problems of intake. So it could be caused by increased requirements and we see this with hyperthyroidism, we see it with pregnancy and lactation and even with fever. It can be caused specifically also by impaired absorption as I mentioned, so prolonged diarrhea, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, for example, will cause uh, difficulties in absorbing uh, this particular vitamin. It could be caused by impaired use, utilization. Uh, and this would be seen in liver disease. Uh, it could be um, caused by a combination of decreased intake, impaired absorption and utilization. And that would still be a secondary thiamine deficiency. Uh, possibly apoenzyme defects occur in alcoholism, for instance, and this would consequently lead to the Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. Uh, it could be also caused by frequent long-term or highly concentrated uh, dextrose infusions, and this can cause a problem as well. Although not exactly the same as beriberi, Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome uh, is also labeled cerebral beriberi. It's seen in alcoholics, but not exclusively. Chronic vomiting, 
eating disorder, and even among the elderly. So the main symptoms of what we call the Wernicke encephalopathy is a cerebral blood flow that is reduced and a certain vascular resistance heightened or increased. The symptoms consist of nystagmus, total ophthalmoplasia, coma, change in mental functioning, and really, if untreated, leads to death. The main symptoms of the Korsakoff syndrome is mental confusion, loss of recent memory, aphonia, uh, and confabulation basically make up the early stage of the Korsakoff syndrome. Be sure to read uh, your textbook chapter 8, which contains uh, a considerably more detail regarding thiamine and the other vitamins that I'm covering in this section verbally. So the purpose of this lecture is really to give you a summary of some of the aspects that need to be highlighted, but more detail is certainly found in your textbook, which is not found in this lecture. Having reviewed thiamine, which is vitamin B1, now I want to review riboflavin, which is vitamin B2. Now you'll note in the foods that are rich in riboflavin that they actually resemble, for the most part, um, quite a bit of the foods that we saw in thiamine. The exception here is that milk uh, is certainly the richest source of riboflavin that you'll find in an array of foods. So this is the most noteworthy difference with thiamine. There are several characteristics to take note of when we're discussing uh, vitamin B2 or riboflavin. Um, one of the main functions that it plays is in metabolism. Note uh, the critical role it plays in energy metabolism uh, via carbohydrate and protein. Uh, part of the coenzymes FMN, flavin mononucleotide, and FAD, flavin adenine dinucleotide, that are used in energy metabolism are intricately, intricately tied to um, riboflavin. Now, ribofl riboflavin is also uh, has an impact on the hematological function of the body. Riboflavin uh, response anemia in humans was described in 1950s. The main characteristics were um, basically an erythroid hypoplasia and reticulocytopenia. Further studies showed that riboflavin deficient diet produced a marked disturbance as well in the production of even red blood cells from the bone marrow. Other studies found that riboflavin deficient diets prevented the um, mobilizing of ferritin iron. Some research suggests that the riboflavin deficiency may even prevent iron absorption from the gastrointestinal tract because of the impact on the mucosa. At the level of the mucosa, we see that there is both a qualitative and quantitative change that's taking place to the gastrointestinal tract uh, once the animals are following a riboflavin deficient diet with clear effects on absorption. So then what's the takeaway? Well first we understand very clearly that riboflavin is involved in carbohydrate protein metabolism so therefore is really critical in energy production for the body. The second part is that we understand that in iron deficient in uh, riboflavin deficiency uh, an individual can experience uh, iron deficiency as well. Uh, and this is a, you know explained by the fact that the gastrointestinal tract is compromised and also the uh, body's ability to mobilize ferritin iron is also compromised in riboflavin deficiency. Additionally, riboflavin's role in the mucosa of the gastrointestinal tract is very critical uh, because in uh, states of riboflavin deficiency, a decreased mucosa appears to take place, which compromises uh, the absorption of other nutrients. As far as riboflavin deficiency, um, riboflavin is kind of unique among water-soluble vitamins in that milk and dairy products 
make up the greatest contribution to the Western diet. Meat and fish are also good sources of riboflavin in certain fruits and vegetable, vegetables, especially dark green vegetables. They contain high concentrations. Grain products are low naturally, uh, but the um, with the uh, enrichment process, riboflavin content in cereal products are actually a pretty good source. Uh, riboflavin deficiency, uh, however, is endemic in populations who exist on diets lacking primarily in dietary products and meats. This is what we see internationally. However, studies from different countries have shown a higher riboflavin intake or better riboflavin status, if you will, among those who consume cereal and breakfast cereals uh, that are enriched with thiamine. Well, if we can wrap our minds around the fact that riboflavin is mostly present in meats and in dairy products specifically, uh, and we can identify, therefore, populations that are particularly at risk, pregnant and lactating women, as well as infants, who, of course, have difficulty accessing dairy and meat products. This would be occurring in developing worlds. In the, our Western nation, the United States in particular, a lot of our breakfast cereals and grains are enriched with riboflavin, so there tends not to be uh, too much of a concern. However, if there is uh, a tendency towards restricting carbohydrates in the diet, as we see a lot in the U.S. for weight control, then we see a primary source of riboflavin uh, being discarded in a very significant way. And that then leaves milk and dairy, uh, milk, dairy, and should we say also uh, meats as a, another alternative source, uh, which could easily be compromised again in weight loss. Of course, school children are at risk as well because they tend not to follow very good eating habits. Uh, they tend to skip, um, many tend to skip their breakfast and that, of course, eliminates uh, one of the rich sources of um, riboflavin in the diet. And then, of course, we see that milk is uh, also not well consumed, especially when there's a lot of soft drinks consumed. The elderly are in a very difficult situation because of difficulty of access of food. Financial restriction and mobility prevents them accessing a good wholesome food regularly, and that would involve milk and meat. And of course, athletes, because of their strange diets, uh, tend to uh, restrict certain categories of food with um, a false you know, understanding of uh, probably benefiting uh, at a performance level. Well, objectively, we can say that there is um, some level, some prevalent level of riboflavin deficiency. Large surveys in the United States reported riboflavin deficiency among the elderly to be roughly between 10 to 27 percent on the basis of biochemical and dietary intake criteria, respectively. Uh, estimates of the prevalence of riboflavin deficiency in various European countries ranges between 7 and 20 percent. There are very distinct physical manifestations of um, riboflavin deficiency uh, that is noteworthy. First of all, we can identify the following. Angular stomatitis, chelosis, glossitis, and microcytic anemia. Angular stomatitis are little red uh, cracks in the corner of the mouth. Uh, chelosis is really an edematous um, lips that become cracked and filled with fluid. And glossitis is what we refer to as kind of a red tongue. And microcytic anemia, of course, is the iron deficiency anemia. So small red blood cell anemia. This slide provides you with a good um, physical and hematological representation of what the various deficiency symptoms are for riboflavin deficiency. So here's glossitis. We have a child sticking out their tongue, which is a red, uh, red sort of uh, glossy uh, tongue. And on the right, or in the middle, I should say, the chelosis, which are the endematous lips. So you can see them slightly inflated with water. And you can see on the corners of the mouth the angular stomatitis. Uh, these are recognizable features that usually are attributed to riboflavin deficiency. And then with a, um, uh, a, blood, uh, you know, a, a blood smear, you'd be able to see the, the really... Uh, uh, great or significant preponderance of uh, microcytic cells. These are the smaller cells that you see lingering along and so suggesting a microcytic anemia. 
Niacin, that is vitamin B3, um, is found in foods that are pretty much similar, similar crossover with thiamine and riboflavin. Notice enriched cereals and breads. Uh, notice as well tuna, pork, and chicken. And what we find um, also is baked potato mushrooms that are a little different uh, and a little particular for niacin. Niacin functions at different levels, but quite significantly at the biochemical level as a coenzyme in fat, carbohydrate, and protein metabolism. So if you thought that riboflavin was quite involved in metabolism, be surprised now to see to what extent niacin is so widely used. It's most prevalent in the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain. It's identified as NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, and also as NADP, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. Niacin is used at a pretty large dose, 60 milligrams, uh, as a treatment of hypercholesterolemia. In fact, it's an alternative to using a statin. It's used... Um, um, cautiously because there's basically some side effects such as red flushing of the face and a lot of patients sometimes don't feel very comfortable with that but it appears that other than the flushing there are no adverse effects to using uh, niacin at such a high dose as 60 milligrams per day. It's also important to be clear that using 60 milligrams per day of niacin is not really using niacin as a true vitamin but usually using it as a pharmaceutical treatment. So it takes on a more of a pharmaceutical characteristic at that high concentration. Niacin deficiency is uh, commonly recognized as uh, the term pellagra. Prevalent in the U.S. South during the 1900s, it was caused by a low-protein corn diet um, and suboptimal niacin and tryptophan intake. Now what's interesting is tryptophan of course is an amino acid. It's one of the essential amino acids and it is um, lacking in the diet of a poor protein intake. So wherever there's a protein deficiency there's likely also a tryptophan um, suboptimal intake and this is what was taking place in the American South. So they had um, a diet that was relying on uh, a refined uh, maize that had literally no niacin and also in an impoverished protein diet that was uh, deficient in tryptophan. And what's important here is that the tryptophan actually gets converted to niacin. It's the only amino acid known to become an actual vitamin. And so the conversion is 60 milligrams of tryptophan uh, creates about one milligram of niacin. So the key symptoms that are manifested here are diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia, and death. These are known as the 4D symptoms. In addition, we see fatigue, decrease of appetite, indigestion commonly found. And of course, these particular symptoms are nonspecific to niacin, but common among many either nutrient toxicities or nutrient deficiencies. But the ones that are clearly specific are the 4Ds. Now, a primary deficiency usually occurs in areas where maize or Indian corn forms a major part of the diet. Um, bound niacin found in maize is not really in assimilated in the intestinal tract unless it was previously treated with alkali, as in the preparation of tortillas. Uh, corn protein is also deficient in tryptophan. Now, the secondary deficiency diseases that, uh, that occur uh, take place in diarrhea, cirrhosis, alcoholism, as well as after extensive post-operative use of nutrient infusions that are lacking uh, the specific vitamin. Pellagra may also occur during prolonged um, isonazide therapy, the drug that replaces nicotinamide in NAD in malignant carcinoid tumor treatments. A brief review of the history of pellagra will provide you with ins some insight with 
uh, with respect to how a vitamin deficiency came to become so prevalent. The year was 1914, and Dr. Joseph Goldberger was sent to the American South to find a cure for the pellagra, which at the time appeared to be an infectious disease. However, Goldberger observed hospitals, asylums, and orphanage employees throughout Georgia, South Carolina, and other southern states. And he observed that never was the disease contracted by the employees. He concluded um, that, in fact, it was not an infectious disease because, indeed, the employees, or at least some of them, should have contracted it if it was. He concluded that diet was linked to pellagra. This was actually... Uh, quite an innovative thought for the earliest, early part of the 20th century. He wrote in the September 1914, no pellagra developed in those who consumed a mixed, well-balanced diet. Carefully controlled dietary studies in orphanages confirmed this theory, and in a classic experiment in a convict camp in Mississippi, Goldberger produced the disease experimentally by diet. Then, provided the uh, wholesome diet, which actually healed the disease. Well, after having chemists and nutritionists analyze the food, the experiments undertaken by Goldberger help identify the pellagra preventative factor in 1926 as actually being part of the B group of vitamins. In October 1928, Goldberger gave his last public address on pellagra at the American Dietetic Association conference. He died the following January. Nine years later, in 1937, a researcher at the University of Wisconsin identified nicotinic acid as the curative factor for pellagra. Illustrated on this slide are some of the physical characteristics that are very much associated with pellagra. Well, first of all, we see the dermatitis. Uh, and we also see something that we commonly see in uh, riboflavin deficiency, which is chelosis. Then we see glycitis, and we also see, again, angular stomatitis. So these are actually very common because when there is one particular B vitamin deficiency, we tend to see, of course, because of the impoverished diet, other B vitamin deficiencies. In this particular slide, we see another example of the dermatitis that affects individuals with pellagra and notice as well uh, the chelosis uh, or um, basically the endematous lips that are apparent here due to uh, riboflavin deficiency as well. So it's very common to actually see both riboflavin and niacin. Why is that? Well because riboflavin deficiency also shows up if you remember in a protein poor and dairy poor environment. Vitamin B6, or pyridoxin, is very different from thiamine, niacin, and riboflavin in that the primary food sources are really protein, notably chicken, fish, pork, organ meats. Uh, we find some whole grain products, and brown rice are a good source of it, uh, soybeans, sunflower seeds, and we see also banana, broccoli, and spinach. So it's widespread a little bit throughout the food supply, but we recognize B6 as primarily rich among protein foods. Thematically, the main foods that are contributing significant amounts of B6 are protein-rich foods, notably chickpeas, which are protein-rich. Then we see beef liver and tuna and salmon and chicken. Uh, and then just jumping over breakfast cereals, we see um, also turkey, uh, marinara sauce and um, spaghetti. Uh, so we see also some um, uh, content in bananas as well. So it's not strictly protein, but we can say that the most abundant amounts of vitamin B6 are certainly found among protein foods. Again, I'd like to remind students to memorize the top five foods that are the richest in vitamin B6. Vitamin B6 is found essentially in three major forms. First, pyridoxin as an alcohol, pyridoxol as an aldehyde, and pyridoxamine, which contains the amino group. 
these are the three forms in which uh, pyridoxin will appear in the biological system. Now, vitamin B6 is greatly involved in protein metabolism. It's not surprising that in our food supply, it's also found primarily in protein as well. Vitamin B6 acts, in fact, as a coenzyme to perform mostly in protein metabolism. Interestingly, the role of B6 in cognitive development is uh, somewhat questionable. It does play certainly a role in the development or the biosynthesis of neurotransmitters like serotonin, nor norepinephrine, and, and epinephrine. Uh, but there's no evidence of um, improved cognition with specific supplements of B6 in individuals that have low serum B6 levels. So this is kind of questionable as a therapeutic modality specifically. Now the role of vitamin B6 in hemoglobin formation certainly has a biochemical base. We know that B6 acts as a cofactor in the synthesis of gamma amino levulinic acid or ALA, a first step in the synthesis of hemoglobin. And there are documented cases in youth of a sideroblastic microcytic anemia occurring due to the poor synthesis of hemoglobin in B6 deficiency. Vitamin B6 in cardiovascular disease is also um, basically supported with the understanding that whenever there's a folic acid, B12, and vitamin B6 combination, there is an ability to lower serum homocysteine levels, which when elevated, um, increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, and when lowered, um, decreases the risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, the role of B6 in immune function is at the moment not that convincing, especially when looking at um, the impact of B6 supplementation. This slide demonstrates how homocysteine, that's at the serum level, is maintained by two pathways. The first pathway that I want to look at is showing how homocysteine is, um, is part of what is feeding the conversion of uh, methyl tetrahydrofolate to folate, which is the active form uh, with the use of B12. So we can say that serum levels of homocysteine are going to decline uh, along with this particular pathway of activating folate uh, along with B12. So in a sense, if there's a B12 deficiency or a folate deficiency, homocysteine levels will not decline uh, to nourish this pathway. The second pathway I want to show you is how homocysteine uh, then it becomes a downward uh, feeder towards the production of the amino acid cys uh, cysteine. So we see it in this pathway requiring uh, vitamin B6 or, or pyridoxin to move to uh, cystothionine and then from cystothionine down to cysteine, which we don't see in this particular graph. So in this sense, in the um, absence of vitamin B6, what we see is not a decrease in homocysteine, but perhaps even a rise in homocysteine, as we would particularly see also in a folate deficiency. And what um, cardiovascular specialists have said is that when there's high levels of homocysteine in the blood, it's an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. In this particular slide, I want to highlight B6 a little bit on the left and its particular role in the mitochondria in the synthesis of gamma uh, amino levulinic acid or gamma ALA as you can see here. This gamma ALA is the first step in the synthesis of protoporphyrin uh, which is the first metabolite that we see upon re-entry into the mitochondria and the protoporphyrin combined with iron which is brought to that location by the protein transferrin once it combines with the protoporphyrin, becomes the hemoglobin. So we can see the importance here of B6 in the synthesis of hemoglobin, and thus the possibility of a hemoglobin deficiency or an anemia of some type uh, related to B6 deficiency. Now I want to move to vitamin D deficiency. This is also nicely described in your textbook. 
Vitamin D is not exclusively found in foods, which is part of the reason why vitamin D initially was not thought to be a vitamin, because it's actually formed in the skin um, through uh, ultraviolet radiation also. Uh, but there are some foods, not many, that have vitamin D in it. First, let's talk about the foods in which vitamin D is naturally found. And we can see it certainly in uh, liver. We can see it in fish of various types, um, notably sardines here at the bottom, the beef liver, for instance, also. Uh, cod liver oil at the top is the most concentrated form um, of, um, of vitamin D. So we have swordfish as well. And then we've got the fortified sources, which is um, uh, basically foods that don't naturally contain it, but that have been fortified with it as a form of public health. So we have milk that has vitamin D added back into it. We call it fortification. Orange juice with vitamin D. We have margarine uh, and butter, for example, with uh, vitamin D in it as well. So when there's not enough vitamin D coming from the sun and that this lack of sun is not compensated by vitamin D coming into the diet, it affects children in a very specific way, affecting the, um, the growth of the, uh, the growth plates of the children at the level of the bones. And so we see in this particular example, uh, rickets manifested with an outward bowing or an inward bowing of the legs. And this is because the bones have lost um, their um, matrix, their consolidated calcium um, matrix uh, that uh, maintains the solidity. Uh, so what you have instead is a lack of a matrix or a bone matrix or otherwise known as hydroxyapatite matrix and you end up with really just osteoid protein dominating and because the osteoid protein is soft as the children are growing uh, the legs because they're no longer calcified uh, are unable to hold up uh, the growing weight of the child and that's where the bowing comes into uh, play. Another symptom of vitamin D deficiency occurring in youth, I mean children, is a delayed closure of the fontanelle, resulting in rapid enlargement of the head. The first treatise on um, rickets was uh, first written by Francis Gliffin back in the 17th century. Uh, he was a scholar, a scientist, a physician, um, and really a born investigator. And he was able, along with a group of other kind of uh, like-minded like individuals, like-minded individuals, to uh, describe rickets uh, in uh, complete form with all the, patho you know, the basic uh, pathological manifestations, uh, but did not recognize um, the part that the diet played uh, in the genesis of this particular disease. One of the observations that they did make that got them kind of closer is that uh, some of their initial observations what they looked was that it looked like those that lived in the city, the children and specifically that lived in the English cities got um, the, the rickets, whereas those that lived outside the city did not. And so they were, tr they were coming to the conclusion that city living in general um, harbored the danger of uh, developing rickets. But this proved to be incorrect because those of the committee, of course, that traveled to the south noticed that uh, in southern cities, uh, in other countries notably, uh, there was no evidence of rickets down there even though the kids lived in the cities. So that kind of excluded the idea, but they were getting close to the understanding that access to sunshine was very important. Of course, in the English um, uh, in the English temperate zone uh, with all the rain and the fog and especially during the winter period. So it's cold, uh, there's very little sun. Uh, that was the, um, the ideal setting, obviously, for the development of rickets in the English cities. Now in chapter 22 of his treatise on rickets, Gliffin gave a clear description of infantile scurvy and showed that though it often accompanied rickets, that it was actually separate, uh, a separate disease entirely. 
It wasn't until 1918 that Edward Mallaby, experimenting with dogs, showed that diet was the determining factor and that cod liver oil could actually prevent the disease from occurring. Now this research uh, looking at the dietary remedy was going on uh, at the same time as other researchers were looking at the role of uh, sunlight um, in the actual healing and prevention of uh, rickets as well. So then the, the, the research on rickets was really coming from two perspectives. One was the dietary and one was looking at the role of sunlight. And they are indeed two separate mechanisms for the prevention of rickets. Now the lack of vitamin D does not only affect children. It does affect children in a very distinct way because their bones are in a period of growth. So we get a more distinct perception of course, with the bowing of the legs. But in adults, we have a disease that's called osteomalacia. And these are occurring in bones that have already been formed, but in which the vitamin D deficiency occurs later on. So we end up with soft bone and bone pain. And this pain is occurring because of impaired phosphorus and calcium absorption due to poor vitamin D. I want to take a close-up of um, the table uh, on this particular slide. I want to draw your attention to the uh, causes of vitamin D deficiency looking specifically at the top to the decrease synthesis of the precursor of vitamin D, which is 7-dehydrocholesterol, which is synthesized under the skin through the interaction of the ultraviolet light on the skin. And then what we see is 7-dehydrocholesterol <clears throat> moving to 25-hydroxycholesterol uh, uh, in the liver. And then we see it down below activated to 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, uh, actually in the kidney. Uh, and this is what we call um, uh, cal um, calcitriol. So 125 dihydroxyvitamin D is the active form, and this is called calcitriol, and it's actually synthesized in the kidney. So in kidney disease, consequently, we will see a tendency towards vitamin D deficiency because the active form that's used as a hormone basically in the blood uh, is not activated. Now again, in liver disease, uh, we see a decrease in the synthesis of the 25-hydroxy um, vitamin D. This is not the active form, but it's a precursor to it. And so if there's no 25-hydroxy vitamin D, then the 125-hydroxy will not be formed as well. So liver disease uh, consequently compromises this whole um, synthesis. Finally, in malabsorption syndrome, difficulty absorbing nutrients, notably fat, um, soluble uh, vitamins like vitamin D, will obviously also lead to a potential uh, deficiency. And finally, let's not forget that a lack of vitamin D intake dietarily uh, can also lead to a deficiency state as well. Now, coming back to uh, osteomalacia, we can see also not only in vitamin D deficiency, but in phosphate deficiency resulting from increased excretion or less absorption uh, will lead to a softening of the bone. This will also be caused by um, a decrease in reabsorption of phosphate. Um, this will occur this reabsorption occurs normally in the renal tubules, and if there's some reason why this reabsorption isn't taking place, uh, then uh, that would also lead to a deficiency. So as a recap and as a point of uh, precision, osteomalacia uh, is very distinct from uh, rickets because it's really attributed to older adults whose bones are already formed. So what takes place here in the adult is there's a loss of phosphate and calcium from the bone. This takes place usually because of uh, poor intake, maybe poor absorption. And then there's also a softening of the bone, which leads, rather than um, to a curvature like in children, it leads to pseudo-fractures of the femur, 
clavicle, scapula, and it's associated with uh, a very uncomfortable bone pain. Now, having said that, there are uh, medical examples of where osteomalacia also is represented with a curvature of the bone. This is actually a, a very um, example of a very chronic problem of uh, poor uh, calcium phosphate intake, excesses, excessive loss, and may be tied also to uh, various types of cancers where the absorption uh, or the excretion rather of calcium and phosphate is excessive. So then we end up with very soft bones, much like the children. Uh, so this is a rickid uh, rickett-like uh, manifestation that's seen in adults and this is due to the actual preponderance of osteoid protein that's the bone page uh, bone protein of the matrix but there is no mineralization that takes place so it's a very similar pathophysiology to children but this is quite exceptional uh, as a representation for osteomalacia that progresses to a rickets like representation so now to help you wrap your minds around how this actually occurs biochemically and endocrinologically, uh, we're going to look at the mechanism of vitamin D metabolism. So I'm going to try to bring you through the different steps here, but the first thing I want you to look at is right in the center. Um, and this is the um, extracellular stability of calcium. And this extracellular stability of calcium is maintained from three perspectives. One, from the calcium coming from the gastrointestinal tract. You could see the arrow going from the um, ileum jejunum uh, right into the extracellular fluid. And you can see also the calcium uh, to be maintained adequately in, in homeostatic uh, style is coming from the breakdown of calcium from the bone. And then we also see that there's a calcium coming from the reabsorption from the kidneys that we see down below, right? Through increased excretion or diminished excretion from the kidney, and then increased absorption or decreased absorption from the gastrointestinal tract, and then decreased um, resorption is what we call the term when it comes down from the bone, right? So a resorption of the bone is a breakdown of the calcium of the bone. So there are three ways in which um, the, there's a homeostasis that's maintained uh, in the actual extracellular fluid, which is really our blood. So now what we see here with the red arrow going up in the extracellular fluid, we're showing if calcium levels are going up in the blood, then we see that the uh, thyroid um, is being uh, specifically targeted. And notably, the parathyroid hormone then, which normally gets secreted in order to break down bone is actually inhibited. You can see here with the big X on the bone. So there is less calcium then being broken down uh, from the bone. We also know that uh, the parathyroid hormone uh, will also calcium reabsorption from the kidney. Uh, but because in this case, when the calcium level is high in the extracellular fluid, parathyroid is not stimulated. So bone is not broken down, the reabsorption of calcium from the kidney tubules is not uh, increased, so the body is not taking that back. And then uh, there is uh, no activation of 25-hydroxy vitamin D to 125. So in other words, there's less activated vitamin D, and that consequently leads to less absorption from the gastrointestinal tract. Now, in a situation where plasma calcium is low, and this would be happening for a variety of reasons, but notably we could talk about poor intake, um, then there would be uh, an increase stimulation. As you can see, low serum calcium leads to an increase in parathyroid hormone. Now, 
the parathyroid hormone will stimulate calcium reabsorption from the tubules. Then um, the parathyroid hormone will also increase uh, kidney synthesis of vitamin D, that's 125 dihydroxy vitamin D or calcitriol, and that will increase intestinal absorption. And then we know also that uh, this is facilitated um, also uh, with the breakdown, right, of uh, calcium from the bones uh, through the action of parathyroid and vitamin D. So both of those together cause what we call a bone resorption or a breakdown of calcium. And all this will come to help regulate the lowering of the blood calcium, which by the way, physiologically, really just takes place a little bit at a time because the body cannot tolerate hypocalcemia for a very long period of time. So these corrections take place very quickly to bring the blood back to a homeostatic state. All right then, now let's review the new concepts. The first concept I'm introducing to you is bone resorption. So if there's high parathyroid hormone, and if that level persists, uh, it impairs bone mineralization. In other words, the parathyroid hormone causes a breakdown or a resorption of bone, leading to osteomalacia, soft bone, and bone pain. Bone weakness tends to lead to fractures more easily, and this is how we sort of explained um, you know, osteomalacia being very distinct uh, from rickets. Now, we also know the new concept here is that there's kidney reabsorption. And so we talk about reabsorption, we're talking about calcium that is being excreted into the kidney tubules, but being reabsorbed by the kidney tubules whenever there is low intracellular calcium. So the body tries to recruit recoup what it is losing in the urine in order to restabilize um, the, um, the serum calcium. Or, and now the um, intestinal absorption is what's facilitated by vitamin D, cal you know, or in other words, the active form, which we call calcitriol. So this absorption is through the gastrointestinal tract, whereas reabsorption is from the kidney tubules, and resorption is you know, taking place from the breakdown of the actual uh, bone calcium. Now, as it pertains to bone synthesis and bone resorption, there are two additional uh, physiological realities that are taking place here. The first, the existence of what we call osteoclasts or osteoclastic cells. They stimulate, they're stimulated by uh, calcitriol or active uh, vitamin D and by the PTH, parathyroid hormone, and causing bone resorption, the breakdown of, of the calcium in the bone. And the, this is performed by the osteoclasts or osteoclastic cells. Now there are also osteoblasts, and this is more um, related to the stimulation um, of the synthesis of bone. And this is done through the effect of the hormone calcitonin uh, which uh, favors osteoblastic cells to start building bone. So osteoblastic cells work when parathyroid hormone is not stimulated, and osteoclastic cells are active when parathyroid horm hormone is activated. The reality, though, is that calcitonin actually blocks osteoclastic cells specifically that prevent the breakdown of bone, thereby favoring uh, the osteoblasts to stimulate bone synthesis. By the 1920s, cod liver oil had been used regularly in the schools as a means of preventing rickets from occurring. Uh, certainly by the 1930s, it had been eradicated thanks to the public health effort of fortifying milk. It was so successful that by the 1960s, um, rickets had been completely eradicated from the U.S. Uh, landscape. So milk fortification was essentially the most successful public health endeavor in U.S. history. Now, having eradicated rickets does not necessarily mean that vitamin 
D deficiency specifically is gone. In fact, the uh, uh, deficiency in the U.S. is still prominent among the elderly, um, or if not prominent, is still visible among the elderly uh, because of reduced skin synthesis. There's less exposure to sunlight. Some of the elderly tend to be more enclosed. There's also reduced milk intake and there's also renal disease that is more prominent. And you remember that 25 hydroxy vitamin D, the inactive form of vitamin D, uh, which is synthesized in the liver, gets uh, activated in the kidney. So if the kidney is diseased, so then the status of vitamin D gets compromised as well. And the causes of this uh, vitamin D deficiency, again, is tied to poor diet, uh, lack of sunlight, and kidney disease. As a form of recap and precision, uh, we can say that a vitamin D deficiency was certainly prominent in the early parts of the 20th century in Canada, in the US, in Western Europe, and also in Asia, and that problem was solved with the fortification of milk with vitamin D. It is, however, now re-emerging uh, in France, in China, and also in some developing nations. How do we assess vitamin D? Well, we assess vitamin D uh, two particular methods. The most prominent one, and the one that tends to be uh, the more stable, is serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Now you know this is not the active form of vitamin D, but this particular concentration of vitamin D in the blood uh, is a good reflection of ultimately the active form in the body. Those individuals who have traditionally been at risk of vitamin D deficiency uh, were those that were living in geographic regions um, uh, you know, above the 40th north parallel and below the 40th south parallel and this is because of the limited sun exposures during the winter months but now we're finding that um, exclusively breastfed babies uh, with skin shielded from the sun and mothers who are deficient in vitamin d uh, tend to create obviously some problems women that are um, let's say deficient in vitamin D tend to be those who do not have their own skin exposed to, to the sun. And this tends to be women who cover their heads and their faces quite extensively even during the summer months. So they've always been sort of tagged as at risk. Uh, dark skinned Middle Eastern babies shielded from the sun, obviously at risk also of vitamin D deficiency. Uh, Non-Northern European immigrants moving to the Northern climate are at risk also because they're not used to this decreased exposure to the sun during the winter months. And so dietarily, they're not necessarily properly adapted to be consuming adequate amounts of uh, vitamin D. Notably, the importance of milk in some of these cultures may not be that, uh, that knowable. Uh, and so they consequently, through ignorance, are not consuming the appropriate amount of vitamin D. Uh, shifts in dietary practices that we see in the South especially, but throughout the country, uh, moving from milk to soda and sweet beverages has also decreased the amount of vitamin D. And then excessive use of sunscreen. And this has been certainly a problem in the Southern areas because of the fear of skin cancer. And as a result, as a result of this excessive sunscreen, there's a decrease uh, exposure of the sun to ultraviolet lights necessary for the synthesis of 7-dehydrocholesterol right under the skin which eventually leads to uh, vitamin D. Now I want to dedicate some time to vitamin E or also known as alpha tocopherol. This is a fat soluble vitamin. So where do we get vitamin E? Well, because it's a fat-soluble vitamin, think about foods that have oil for the most part. Not exclusively so. But certainly uh, avocado, and remember avocado actually has some oil in it. Wheat germ has oil into it. Vegetable oils are a very good source of vitamin E, margarine and butter. Egg yolk, nuts because of also their uh, oil content, peanut butter has it, liver, and then of course fortified cereals, which of course are not oil-based, but the vitamin E is added to the cereal using a an oil mist so that it can actually stick to the food. 
So very clearly, it's possible to see vulnerabilities. In our fat-free um, dietary practices, we can see how many, especially those who are trying to lose weight, tend to eliminate oil from the diet. So whenever oil is eliminated from the diet and whenever the breakfast is eliminated from the diet, notably the cereals that have the fortified of vitamin E, we tend to see vitamin E levels decline, being quite low. When I've done a dietary analysis with my students online, I've found that close to 60 to 70 percent of the young women uh, that were taking my class that were doing their nutrient analysis were actually uh, well below 67 percent of the DRI for vitamin E. I want to take a look at a more extensive um, categorization of foods. Let's look at the top 10 vitamin E rich foods. And we can see again wheat germ uh, being the most prominent. Now, I want to point out here that wheat germ normally found in wheat of course has been eliminated through processing and it's doing that in order to stabilize bread making because with wheat germ there's also wheat germ oil and that wheat germ oil uh, gets oxidized very quickly and goes rancid and so for the a stability of bread in the shelf uh, that doesn't work so well and so when there's a question here of mass distribu distribution of, of uh, bread which has taken place since the early 1900s um, this has occurred and our population consequently has lost a great amount of um, uh, vital vitamin E in their diet because of course everyone had bread and this is of course an argument for going back to bread making at home using whole wheat with wheat germ all right so let's continue the list then so we have uh, sunflower seed uh, dry roasted we have almond we have um, sunflower uh, seed oil we have safflower oil hazelnuts peanut butter peanuts corn oil and then at the very bottom some spinach boiled so again I encourage students to memorize the top five of this um, top 10 vitamin E rich foods Vitamin E's main function is that of an antioxidant. It's the main defender of um, oxidative damage to the tissue of the body. It's found within um, the lipid bilayer surrounding the cells. Um, and it protects the cells against lipid oxidation. So it's basically the last uh, layer of protection for the cell because vitamin E is a fat soluble vitamin it's found within that lipid bilayer so it's protecting the cell on the outer outskirts of the cell the outside of the cell uh, from the um, intrusive oxidative stress coming from the free radicals it also protects uh, white blood cells against oxidation so in that sense it has uh, you know uh, the property of improving the immune response Staying with the antioxidant theme, I want to start talking about vitamin C or ascorbic acid, which is a significant antioxidant. Now, when thinking of vitamin C um, and the food sources of vitamin C, uh, we often think about citrus fruits, oranges, limes, grapefruits. Uh, and this is true. These are indeed very rich in vitamin C, but there are other sources as well. Indeed, uh, in addition to citrus, we also have asparagus, papaya, strawberries, cantaloupe, uh, green peppers, and the cabbage family, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the Brussels sprouts. And so in that sense, even the northern regions, such as in Minnesota, uh, we have you know, cauliflower, broccoli, and Brussels sprouts. And while they don't resound as loudly as the citrus fruits, uh, they are still good sources of vitamin C and this is how the northern regions prevented uh, scurvy. So as we look at this list, uh, the viewer will probably be quite surprised to see that red pepper, sweet raw, half a cup, has um, the most significant amount of vitamin C. Now next we've got a quarter cup of orange juice, 
Uh, we've got three quarters of a cup of grapefruit juice, a medium orange, kiwi, but we also have a little further down green peppers and notice the broccoli, strawberry, the Brussels sprouts. And so we have a mixture here of cabbage foods and vegetables and fruits, uh, which are contributing significant amounts of vitamin C. Now, vitamin C is very interesting to look at because it's been extensively studied. And you can see the drastic um, comparisons between the requirements, the RDAs, for men 90 milligrams per day, for women 75. And if you're a smoker, uh, then you add 35 milligrams onto that. But when examining the toxicity levels, you can see that the upper level for adults is 2,000 milligrams per day. So on this tower, uh, you can see where the um, 90 milligrams is situated. You can see where 35 milligrams a day is necessary for normal basic metabolism. And then all the way at the top is what we consider um, the, um, the beginnings of the toxic uh, level intake. So anything above that 2,000 milligrams. So there is room to take in excessive amounts of this particular vitamin without creating any particular harm. And again, it's a water-soluble vitamin, so it gets excreted in the urine. Now, there is some debate if taking excessive amounts of vitamin C above uh, the tissue saturation level uh, has any benefit. Because as you can see in this particular graph, tissue ascorbic acid concentrations increase linearly for uh, right up until about 100 milligrams per day. And then afterwards, it sort of stabilizes. Uh, and the question then is once the tissues are saturated, what happens to the vitamin C? Well, the vitamin C is actually excreted in the urine. So if it's being excreted in the urine, clearly the biochemists tell us that there's no additional protection uh, given by ascorbic acid if you exceed literally 100 milligrams per day. Um, so taking mega doses of a gram or 1,000 milligrams up to 2,000 milligrams ends up only resulting in very expensive urine with no physiological benefits to be seen with this kind of mega dosing. Now the function of ascorbic acid could be seen in four very distinct activities. First of all, collagen synthesis in the muscles. So the collagen is very important uh, in the formation of um, basically connective tissue. And then we have it playing a role as a neurotransmitter, um, such as in the synthesis of neurotransmitters, norepinephrine and serotonin. And we also have it playing a role as an antioxidant. Um, and at high concentrations, it would appear when we're mega dosing above 2,000 milligrams per day that we're probably using vitamin C as a pro-oxidant. Uh, and um, also we know that it, um, uh, it activates the oxidizing elements like iron and copper. Uh, and so that's, you know, part of the pro-oxidant effect that we suspect is taking place. And then we know that also that it supports the immune system. So a lack of collagen causes the walls of the body's blood capillaries to break down. Hemorrhaging occurs uh, throughout the body and then also at the level of the connective tissue it causes a lot of pain in the muscle and uh, and uh, so hardship for the individual. I want to look at uh, vitamin C deficiency uh, the primary symptoms that are very much attached to this uh, disease, this deficiency disease. And these are symptoms that begin about one month without vitamin C. And this is occurring because vitamin C is a water-soluble vitamin. It doesn't actually store for extensive periods of time like the fat-soluble vitamins. Consequently, within one month of consuming, um, you know, significantly less uh, vitamin C that would be less than about 15 milligrams per day uh, would end up uh, leading to bleeding gums and joints, loosening of the teeth, um, receding gum lines, subcutaneous hemorrhaging, bone and joint pain, as well as depression. And this, of course, tied to the fact that vitamin C is tied to neurotransmitter synthesis. Uh, deficiency in the U.S. highly restricted diets and alcohol uh, taken in large amounts tend to create this deficiency. 
So whenever I have a patient that is radically cutting back on carbohydrates and avoiding fruits of all kind, as well as vegetables, then I'm suspicious uh, of vitamin C deficiency. Uh, and then when I you know, inquire about um, you know, breakfast practices and I find that they're avoiding cereals in the morning, which of course many of them are enriched with vitamin C, then you've got lack of you know, cereal enriched vitamin C, you have no fruits with vitamin C, you have no vegetables with vitamin C, and you're not taking any supplements, then there's a concern for a, a possible vitamin C deficiency. So nutritionists need to keep a critical eye, especially in highly restricted diets. I think images show um, are worth really a thousand words. So when we look at this, we see uh, the receding um, gum line and loose tooth, so the periodontal disease so characteristic of scurvy. We see poor wound healing, aching bones and joints because of the poor collagen formation. We see skin um, discoloration due to the ruptures of the capillaries and consequently the petechia that ends up characterizing these little bursts of blood, uh, blood vessels in the arm and the leg so they come across as little um, uh, points of blood, uh, little dots of blood if you will on the skin. Additionally anemia is also a byproduct uh, or by consequence, if you will, of vitamin C deficiency. And this is because uh, iron absorption, non-heme iron absorption, requires vitamin C. So in vitamin C um, uh, deficiency, uh, anemia tends to occur, and this is actually why people tend to suffer from fatigue. This is even a closer look. We can see the gingivitis, the bleeding gums, and then we see the skin lesions and the loss of capillary, capillary integrity causing the bursting of the capillaries in the skin, which create the little red dots, which we call petechia. The first real treatise on vitamin C deficiency or scurvy was written by William Stark, MD, uh, back in the 18th century. It was published in 1788 and provided a pretty thorough description of the various symptoms of the disease. You probably remember from your history books that scurvy used to affect the um, the ships that were colonizing America because they were spending, of course, extended periods of time at sea. And this was certainly developed uh, once world travel, world exploration became very dominant and important in the 17th century uh, and into the 18th century. And we consequently had a growing problem. And so it isn't uh, surprising that um, uh, medical professionals would start writing or investigating this particular disease because it had such powerful consequences on the Navy and therefore on intercontinental travel and consequently on trade. Let's do a little historical review of scurvy. William Stark, who we mentioned previously who had written this treatise on scurvy, was, an, was English and um, uh, of Scottish um, parentage and who studied medicine in Edinburgh and London. He returned to London and undertook dietary studies upon himself, uh, something that's highly discouraged. He was a healthy six-foot young man, and he underwent 24-hour dietary uh, experiments in which he culminated, uh, which culminated into his death after seven months. In his book, there's a careful description of Stark's uh, progressive decline in health as he began restricting different foods. In the first experiment, the diet was bread and water, 31 days. In succeeding experiments, he used bread and water, added other foods one at a time, olive oil, milk, roast goose, boiled beef, fat, figs, and veal. He recorded that after the first two months, the gums of both jaws were red and swollen, and bled when pressed. Experts undoubtedly conclude that what he was experiencing was scurvy and contributed ultimately in his early death at the age of 29. His experiments were of course published by James uh, Carmichael Smith 18 years later. His work clearly intimated that the origins of uh, scurvy were clearly of a dietary origin. 
Not long after Nicholas Stark's uh, findings were published in the treatise on vitamin C, James Lynn observed that citrus fruits contained something that counteracted the ravages of scurvy. And this led to the development of a method to try to preserve citrus fruits uh, at sea. He came to this conclusion through an experiment called the Sansbury experiment, which was the name of the ship that he used, where he tested the theory on controls and treatment groups. The controlled received uh, no citrus fruits, whereas the treatment groups uh, received various types of acidic foods, including sulfuric acid, but also acidic fruits, and was able to show that the group uh, receiving the acidic fruit did much better in terms of avoiding scurvy. In 1795, the British Royal Navy then provided a daily ration of limes uh, and lime juice to the men, and English sailors uh, during that time were called limeys because their cargo hulls were full of limes to protect them against the scurvy. It wasn't until 1932 that Wah and King at the University of Pittsburgh and Albert Zen Georgi, a Hungarian scientist, were able to isolate and synthesize ascorbic acid or vitamin C. So here's an integration question. Um, identify the vitamins that are involved in bone metabolism. Pause here and do some research and see what kind of answer you can come up with. The correct answer, vitamin D or calcitriol, the active form, vitamin A, which becomes retinoic acid and the retinoic acid favors osteoclasts, and then we have vitamin K, philoquinone. Now I'd like to take a look at the minerals and the micro minerals. Well, the first macro mineral I want to talk about is, um, is potassium, K. 98% uh, of it is located inside the cell, so it's an intracellular cation. Uh, and it, when we look ab ab at its function, we see that sodium and potassium actually work together because um, sodium is an extracellular um, mineral and potassium is an intracellular, and we have basically... Uh, across membrane sodium potassium pumps that are causing or helping in muscle contraction and nerve conductions. Um, the uh, adequate intake for potassium is about 4,700 milligrams per day. And w in terms of health, there are very specific guidelines, very specific repercussions for any uh, blood level deviance of potassium. Uh, for example, uh, hyperkalemia, which is a toxic amount of potassium in the blood can affect, uh, you know, can be toxic because it affects um, severe cardiac arrhythmias and cardiac arrest as well as vomiting. And we also have the counterpart, which is um, hypokalemia. And this occurs also in vo vomiting and diarrhea, the use of diuretics, for example. And the result is uh, muscular weakness, nervous irritability, mental disorientation, cardiac arrhythmia, and also death. Now, what we know is potassium may counteract the effect of sodium and calcium when it's taken in excess amount. So this is a, a cautionary remark to be careful about taking um, potassium pills uh, because they can actually affect, like I said, that sodium um, and calcium balance in the body. This particular table will show you where most of the potassium is coming from in the diet. And we can see the large green bars here. That is notably uh, the vegetables and um, uh, products that are contributing here. So we have broccoli, we have carrots, uh, we have potatoes, um, and um, other sorts of vegetables and fruits like bananas and oranges. I think frequently people think of bananas as the major source of, um, of uh, potassium, but actually it's uh, potatoes. And um, oftentimes, again, after uh, marathon runs or 10 kilometer runs, uh, there are often um, bananas on the table as well as oranges uh, to help um, uh, regulate you know, the blood potassium uh, in the runners to avoid cramps and things of that nature. But often forgotten are the dairy products, notably milk and yogurt, 
uh, cottage cheese, and then we've got pinto beans, uh, and so forth, and then squash and avocado. So you could see that potassium is nicely distributed and very abundant in the diet. And it is also true that potassium is richly found in meats such as ground beef, chicken, and we also see it in tuna and some quantity in, in egg as well. The next macro mineral that I want to investigate is calcium. 99% of the calcium is actually located in the bone, so really 1% is what we see in the blood. The major dietary source of calcium is milk and cheese, yogurts. There are also non-dairy products, soy milk, tofu, um, also uh, almond milk and rice milk, which have been also, shall we say, fortified with calcium, not just processed with calcium. There are also vegetables that contain calcium, but they also can, uh, contain oxalates, and these oxalates will bind calcium. So we generally say that uh, the calcium contribution of vegetables is actually lesser than what you would get from dairy because of the presence of these oxalates. But notably, Brussels sprouts, uh, cauliflower, Chinese cabbage, uh, really good sources um, of calcium, a nice complementary source, not comparable to dairy though. Uh, but with the oxalates, even less is really available for absorption. When we look at absorption, it actually varies between 25 to 75% of calcium is absorbed. And uh, absorption is enhanced uh, with vitamin D. The AI for calcium is 1,000 milligrams per day, and the UL, the upper tolerable limit, is 2,500 milligrams. Now, in terms of nutrient interactions, we know that vitamin D uh, causes an increased absorption and also a decreased urinary excretion of calcium. Now, this is what we know medically about calcium and disease prevention. Uh, we know through the DASH diet experiments that it may protect against hypertension. The DASH diet that was rich in magnesium, in calcium, and potassium, um, and moderately low in sodium, had a tendency to lower the blood pressure in populations that were followed. The DASH diet recommended reduced meat, butter, and high fat foods. Uh, the DASH diet encouraged uh, fish, poultry, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and nuts, very similar, if you will, to the Mediterranean diet. So based on experiments looking at population trends epidemiologically in terms of disease trends, uh, it looks like calcium may protect against colon cancer, diabetes, um, and high cholesterol. And it also appears that when calcium is elevated in the diet, uh, that obesity tends to be lesser in that population. And that's strictly uh, tied not so much to the calcium, but to the dietary uh, involvement. Uh, so whenever milk is high in the diet, that means soda pop is less in the diet. That's generally the strongest association. And in that sense, calcium then becomes protective against obesity. It's believed that calcium's role in the regulation of blood pressure is done in the following manner. It appears that calcium activates a protein called calmodulin, and this calmodulin relays messages to inside um, the cells, um, thereby regulating blood pressure. So let's take a look at the importance of calcium homeostasis and how homeostasis is managed and we'll see something quite similar to what we saw with the vitamin D metabolism. So we're looking at bone mass and we're looking at the stability of plasma calcium right in the middle of the slide and we can see that when the calcium is remained um, a level that the breakdown or in other words the resorption of bone is equal to the synthesis of bone facilitated through the osteoblast, specifically calcitonin, stimulating the osteoblast to actually form bone mass. And we have a healthy bone mass taking place here. 
And again, as mentioned previously, the plasma calcium is maintained constant through three fronts, the intestinal absorption of calcium, the breakdown or the resorption of bone from the, from, um, of bone calcium, and then also the renal tubular reabsorption of calcium. These three ways are used to keep the, the plasma calcium relatively constant, and this is stimulated, of course, through the parathyroid hormone, the active vitamin D, calcitriol, which favors calcium reabsorption, and then vitamin D favoring um, intestinal reabsorption, and parathyroid and vitamin D favoring um, calcium uh, or bone resorption. Now looking at plasma calcium and the lower arrow, we're indicating here when calcium has a tendency in the blood to sort of grow towards a lower level. This is quickly upregulated by first the resorption of bone. So the parathyroid hormone and vitamin D are acting here to help um, regulate or upregulate, if you will, uh, the plasma concentrations of calcium by breaking down calcium from the bone. This is called bone resorption. So it's helping that. And the parathyroid is used also um, uh, with a calcitriol or active vitamin D to uh, stimulate calcium reabsorption from the renal tubules. So that's helping to bring back the calcium levels. And um, we also know that, um, that calcitriol will help stimulate calcium uh, from the gut in order to favor a greater calcium absorption in addition to phosphorus uh, from the gut in order to favor this uh, sort of process of breaking down, you know, or, or re-aligning um, the plasma calcium. Now in this process, um, the osteoclasts are actually dominating now. So the uh, osteoclastic cells are breaking down the calcium and from the bone and then uh, maintaining, in other words, a, um, a regular plasma calcium. When plasma calcium is normalized, then osteoblastic cells will dominate and shut off the osteoclastic cells in order to favor um, bone synthesis. And this is stimulated through calcitonin, which is secre secreted through the thyroid. And at that point, uh, parathyroid hormone will then decrease. Now, when there's a chronically low intake of calcium, what ends up happening, as you can see, uh, the bone mass ends up decreasing because there is an uncontained um, resorption of bone uh, in order to maintain the plasma calcium with the idea that there is insufficient intestinal calcium and then the renal reabsorption only contributes so much. So in the end, there's kind of a net negative that takes place, and this ne net negative is compensated for by the bone, resulting in a smaller bone mass. And this is when we sort of see uh, the dangers of osteoporosis. The occurrence of early postmenopausal osteoporosis, especially in women, can be offset by attaining a peak bone mass somewhere between 20 to 30 years of age. This is roughly what geneticists tell us is our ideal age uh, category or range through which um, we can attain ma maximal bone mass through ideal dietary intakes of calcium, through dairy products in particular. And this is why it's very important to encourage children to consume their milk and eat their dairy products on a regular basis in order to favor um, proper bone mass. And so they have right up until the range of 20 to 30 to reach that ideal bone mass. Afterwards, uh, there is a steady bone decline which gets exponentially greater after menopause. And so consequently, to keep away from the danger zone associated with um, osteoporosis, it's important to really meet that peak bone mass early in our uh, 20s and 30s. Now this graph illustrates the 
um, exponential decline that I was talking about, the rapid decline during the postmenopausal period. And you can see that right up until the age of 30, this reinforces the point that you can reach your genetic potential. So the woman in green, woman A, obviously reached a high potential as a young w w lady, consuming probably adequate amounts of calcium through an appropriate dairy intake. But by contrast, woman B did not do that. And we can see that the decline in bone um, density actually follows the same kind of slant, the same kind of slope. Uh, once they hit m uh, menopause, you can see that the decline is also of equally accentuated. But clearly, the woman B that did not meet her full genetic potential uh, is now by the time she's in her menopause period is reaching a very serious danger zone in terms of bone. But the woman A having had a higher bone potential at the beginning at age 30, even though she's going through the same slope of decrease in bone density, is still well outside the danger zone. And you can see clearly after 60, woman B is in the period in the zone that is of high risk of osteoporosis, whereas well after her 60s, woman A is clear of the danger zone and of osteoporosis. Well, like calcium, phosphorus is mostly found in bone. 85% of it is located in bone. And the foods that are rich in protein, like milk and meat and eggs, uh, really contain a lot of um, phosphorus. Uh, milk contains uh, both calcium and phosphorus, and this is ideal because the ideal ratio of calcium and phosphorus is one-to-one, -one, and milk is very close to having a one-to-one -one ratio of calcium and phosphorus. Now, processed, processed foods, such as soft drinks, contain some phosphorus, but no calcium. And so when you're consuming um, soft drinks, for example, you're bringing in phosphor phosphorus, but no calcium. And over a day's intake, what you end up with is a dis an imbalance in that calcium to phosphorus ratio. More phosphorus in the end of the day than you have calcium. And then you've got processed meat, which is also high in phosphorus as well. Now you've got nutrient interactions here that are worthy of consideration. Vitamin D causes an increase of intestinal absorption of phosphorus. I mentioned that in previous slides, along with calcium. And the molar ratio that is ideal for calcium and phosphorus is one. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. And this is ideal for proper bone calcification. Uh, scientists that have been looking at calcium homeostasis have argued that whenever there's an excessive amount of calcium or an excessive, excessive amount of false phosphorus, that there's an imbalance and a breakdown of calcium uh, from the bone. So you end up with more calcium in the urine. So in true meaning, this results in a decalcification of bone whenever the imbalance of calcium to phosphorus is greatly changed. Now, looking at the food sources of phosphorus, we could see that there are three main categories, the milk, the yogurt, cottage cheese, and then you've got pinto beans, sunflower seeds, and so forth. And then you've got meats that are good sources of phosphorus, and liver in particular, which is exceptionally rich in phosphorus. So magnesium is located much like calcium and phosphorus in bone, but not to the same extent. 55 to 60 percent of magnesium in the body is found in the bone, whereas 20 to 25 percent is found in muscle. Now the sources uh, are nuts and legumes and whole grains and seafood, fruits, green leafy vegetables. Um, Refined foods are essentially poor sources of magnesium. So whenever a diet is highly refined, uh, then there is grounds to suspect that there may be um, suboptimal intakes of magnesium. Now, unlike calcium that has a fairly high absorption rate, magnesium's uh, absorption is about 50%. Um, Items in the diet that interfere with absorption are fiber, 
uh, also uh, high levels of calcium and phosphorus intakes. These may actually interfere with the magnesium absorption. So this is a really important argument in terms of taking supplementation and to be very careful. Uh, so an example of abuse would be, for instance, uh, high levels of calcium supplements in the diet uh, and this effect um, uh, basically hindering magnesium absorption. Uh, this is certainly exaggerated quite a bit if the diet is also impoverished in magnesium. So not only are you not getting enough magnesium, but the little magnesium you have is countered by excessive supplementation, for example, of calcium and phosphorus. Now, deficiencies are fairly rare, outright deficiencies, but when they do occur, they're often linked to alcoholism. So what we're really concerned about is not so much a deficiency, but really suboptimal intakes. Now, toxicities uh, don't tend to occur with food, uh, but really with supplements. Um, and so the UL for the magnesium, the upper tolerable limit, is 350 milligrams per day. But this strictly from the perspective of supplement intake. All right then, so how about a little summary? So the main function um, takeaway here for magnesium is bone mineralization, just like calcium and phosphorus. So there's a significant amount of magnesium in bone, the maintenance of teeth, very important, and also for muscle contractions. Zinc is the next nutrient or micro mineral that I'd like to take a look at. So as a rule, a well-trained nutritionist will recognize that whenever there's a low zinc intake, proteins in the food tend to be low. And we can see this here um, work out very clearly as we see um, dairy products are very, very good source. We can see that uh, sunflower seeds and um, uh, also like pinto beans and things of that nature, that ground beef is a very good source. We can see oysters, sirloin steaks, uh, these are all excellent sources. So as a rule, whenever zinc is low, we tend to uh, want to investigate what the protein intake is in that particular patient. Here are the top foods rich in zinc, starting with oysters at the top, representing 493% of the daily value. Then it drops down to 47% uh, of the daily value for beef chuck, and then crab, Alaska king, at 43% of the daily value. Then beef patties at 35. Breakfast cereals, of course, have a lot of fortified zinc in them, so we, we reach about 25% of the daily value. Lobster, very rich. Pork, uh, baked beans, chicken, dark meat, uh, and then yogurt, a little bit in there as well. So what we conclude from this is that zinc usually is associated with rich sources of actual protein. So therefore, whenever um, protein uh, intake is suboptimal and chronically suboptimal, uh, nutritionists and dietitians usually raise some concerns about the likelihood that zinc intake might actually be compromised as well. So again, students, I urge you to memorize the top five foods that are rich in zinc. This particular slide is going to look over the uh, function of zinc, uh, the role of metallothionine uh, as a storage component for zinc, and the value of metallothionine and zinc in overall health. And we'll take it uh, systematically moving first towards the left and going full circle all the way back up to the right. Well, if we start with zinc in food, we know that um, uh, foods that are whole grains, cereals, legumes, uh, and such have what they call phytates in them. And these phytates are actually uh, binding agents that bind the zinc and make it less available. So this is why we always argue that the, uh, the zinc in animal foods is much, has a much higher bioavailability than the zinc that you would get in the vegetable and cereal uh, categories. Now let's follow the uh, arrow up to the orange box that we see that zinc can also be found in lozenges and these lozenges have been found in controlled studies to actually be very effective in reducing the duration of colds. 
Uh, and so that is actually considered an effective uh, medical treatment um, for, uh, for individuals whose immune systems are compromised and there seems to be uh, certainly a therapeutic value to zinc lozenges that's well uh, recognized and well tested. Now moving to the left in the brown box we know that also um, that zinc is very important in preserving the stability uh, of biological membranes for instance and that it's uh, playing a key role in providing uh, structural support to proteins by directly impacting um, elements in nucleic acids and in gene regulating proteins. Well additionally the pancreas uses zinc to make digestive enzymes and secretes them right into the intestine. So now we go right into the middle of the graph and we can see the mucosal cells in the intestine store the excess of zinc in a protein system called metallothionine and the metallothionine is acting as a, a kind of a good sort of storage unit for the zinc and lets it out as the body requires it for instance um, it will uh, release zinc to albumin and transferrin for transport in the body but we also know that uh, the zinc will also be very uh, a very important signaling device in um, oxidative or in prevention uh, against oxidative stress. Hence when nitric oxide or um, reactive oxygen species are released into the body the methylothionine protein will also likewise release zinc in order to basically favor um, an antioxidant response to the free radical uh, nitric oxide releases into the body that put the body under a tremendous amount of stress. So this is a reminder that the metallothionine protein is really uh, an internal reservoir for zinc and it judiciously lets the zinc out uh, in accordance to the requirements of the body. An interesting nutrient-nutrient interactions to take note of is that when um, large concentrations of iron beyond 25 milligrams per day is given uh, as a dosage, it has a tendency to decrease uh, zinc absorption. So now as a matter of a recap, what really compromises zinc absorption is the presence of uh, phytates and cereals and grains, for example, and legumes. Uh, this makes the zinc uh, from these particular food sources less biologically active. And we know that a large doses of vitamin, or not vitamin, but iron, uh, that are greater than 25 milligrams will also basically inhibit uh, zinc absorption. Now one of the consequences of zinc deficiency is the stunted growth or sometimes dwarfism. The role of zinc in the body can be seen in so many different um, dimensions, notably the immune system. It affects the neutrophil and macrophages uh, in the body, causing them to go down. It's involved in protein synthesis, DNA synthesis, cell division, and has a direct effect on taste and smell. So that's one of the characteristics that disappears in uh, zinc deficiency is precisely that, um, that ability to taste and smell. In severe um, deficiencies, there's hair loss, which is much more dramatic, diarrhea, there's delayed sexual maturation in young children. In the image on this slide, we could see this 17-year-old uh, who really is only four feet tall. So there's a severe um, delay in growth. Uh, there's hypogonadism as well, so a lack of sexual maturation. Um, at risk are children that are breastfed for ex exclusively breastfed for extended periods of time, uh, notably children that are 7 to 12 months old that are still only being breastfed are at high risk also of zinc deficiency because of the poor content of zinc uh, in the breast milk, uh, poor in the sense that it's insufficient to meet uh, the uh, needs of a 7 to 12 month old baby. On the international stage, zinc deficiency uh, affects about 20% of the world population. It occurs 
usually along with iron deficiency. And the symptoms are growth retardation, dermatitis, and also diarrhea. Now, it's interesting um, that these are the symptoms because essentially zinc plays a role in cell division and consequently would affect absorption uh, through the gastrointestinal tract, much like folate. And zinc is also involved in protein synthesis. And it's interesting that zinc is also abundantly found in protein foods as well. So consequently, both um, cell division and protein synthesis uh, would clearly have, um, uh, would clearly be important functions uh, involved in growth, for instance, and in the replication of skin tissue. Thus, the dermatitis and also growth retardation are not surprising. Now, copper is very different than zinc in that it's not primarily in protein foods. In fact, in some organ foods, but mostly plant foods like nuts and seeds and legumes. Here's some examples. So at the top of the list, the most um, concentrated copper is in oysters and then shiitake mushrooms, firm tofu, sweet potatoes, sesame seeds, cashews, chickpeas, salmon, dark chocolate and avocado. So you can see copper uh, is not primarily found in protein foods like zinc. So it's very much of a distinction. Now, dietary deficiencies are rare because the typical diet is, um, in America at least, is uh, adequate and will involve at least some of these foods, especially uh, in the individuals that are careful not to be consuming junk food on a regular basis. Now there are some genetic abnormalities. Menke's disease is a copper that's not released into circulation. So basically copper that is captured uh, within um, uh, within the body but not released. The Wilson's disease is a, a copper accumulation in the liver and the brain and it leads to serious disability. Now the main function of copper is its involvement as an antioxidant, right? It's part of the antioxidant process, just like zinc. Uh, it's also important in uh, iron metabolism as it assists in hemoglobin synthesis. So that's actually quite important and aids uh, in more recent research in the absorption of iron specifically. The RDA is 900 micrograms and you can see the upper tolerable limit is um, 10,000 micrograms per day. Now, sodium is a principal cation of extracellular fluid, and let's contrast that with potassium, which was a principal cation of intracellular fluid. Now, it's the primary regulator of uh, body extracellular fluids. This is what it's generally recognized as, and so that sweat losses are made up primarily of sodium and chloride. Um, diarrhea and vomiting uh, which is excessive and chronic could cause sodium loss and this is why rehydration with electrolytes notably sodium uh, chloride uh, and sugar is oftentimes um, recommended now roughly 40 percent of salt which is NaCl is made up of sodium so if somebody is consuming a gram of salt or in other words a thousand milligrams of salt you could assume that 40 percent of that or 400 milligrams is actually made up of sodium now the upper tolerable limit the UL for sodium is 2300 milligrams per day this is the maximum recommended in a day uh, above which uh, there is uh, a risk of being um, in excessive amounts. Uh, the daily value as it shows up on the food labels, the nutrition facts panel, uh, is uh, 2,400 milligrams per day. So what happens then is um, the reason for these sort of upper limits is that high sodium intake is associated with uh, calcium excretion. So in other words, diets that are very high in processed foods, which are also high in sodium, uh, have a deleterious or a negative effect on bone density because of the excessive um, calcium depletion from the bone that takes place over time. And this is kind of an argument for not eating a lot of processed food over an entire lifetime. Now the DASH diet study showed us that sodium, salt specifically, exacerbates hypertension. Salt also has a greater effect on uh, rising blood pressure than even sodium or chloride alone. 
Now, salt and sodium restrictions uh, are generally followed to decrease blood pressure, and the aim for a sodium diet that is pretty restrictive is about 1,500 milligrams per day. This is the kind of diet you would prescribe for a patient uh, whose blood pressure is definitely elevated uh, and uh, who needs to bring that pressure down uh, without medication initially. So loss of weight and sodium restriction combined together can actually sufficiently bring the BP down. Now, recognizing that sodium represents 40% of salt content, you can therefore work out that 1,500 milligrams a day of sodium really is, um, you know, would be less than 3,750 milligrams per day of salt. And this is basically saying, in an algebraic equation, 40% or 0.4 times salt content, which we don't know, is equal to 1,500. So 1,500 divided by 0.4 gives us, therefore, the salt content. So what we know about the daily content of salt in a diet, it's approximately 5 to 7 grams per day. So we're pretty high salt consumers. Um, in instances of, um, uh, for instance, excessive water intake that we see sometimes in runners uh, that are constantly um, drinking to replenish fluid content, which is perceived as being lost through the running process, there is a danger of uh, getting what we what runners called um, a water intoxication. But this is actually called hyponatremia. This is a drop in the blood values of sodium, and this hyponatremia um, is characterized by, uh, you know, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, fatigue, uh, mental confusion. Uh, so very, very dangerous. So now the recap of an integration question. You know, in bone formation, what vitamins are critically involved? First, we have vitamin D. The active form of vitamin D is calcitriol. And the cal calcitriol, if you remember, when uh, calcium levels are low, uh, stimulates the parathyroid hormone, which then activates 25-hydroxyvitamin um, D to become 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, which is calcitriol, in the kidney. And this particular vitamin D then is instrumental in favoring bone resorption, and so therefore favoring the osteoclast to act uh, and to break down bone, so to allow the renewal of bone. It also favors the absorption, if you will, of calcium from uh, the gastrointestinal tract and also uh, the reabsorption of calcium from the uh, renal tubules. Vitamin A, uh, if you remember, um, has retinol converting to retinoic acid and the retinoic acid also involved in stimulating the osteoclasts which favor the breakdown of bone but only to allow the renewing of bone to take place. So there's got to be a constant breaking down and renewal of bone for bone formation uh, to take place and growth formation to take place as well. So it's very critical there. And we know that vitamin K is also very much involved uh, at the level of uh, the protein synthesis uh, of the osteoids, uh, which is the uh, protein of the bone. Around which, uh, the matrix then gets formed that gives the bone its actual solidity or crystallization, if you will. This is the end of the presentation on micronutrients, and I'd like to encourage students now to take this training quiz. But first, before doing that, perhaps reread your chapter and uh, review the PowerPoint um, presentation as well in the form of the video, and then sit down and see how well you do. So this question is about organizing the foods that are at the bottom, spinach, clams, chickpeas, and so forth, and aligning them with the nutrient uh, that is found most prominently within them. So pause here and think through your problem, and I'll show you the answer on the next slide. So now if your foods are correctly aligned, then with vitamin C you would have oranges. 
With uh, thiamine, you would have breakfast cereals. For vitamin A, retinol, you would have yams or sweet potatoes. For vitamin D, you would have cod liver oil. For folate, you would have spinach. Vitamin B12, clams. Vitamin B6, chickpeas. And for zinc, you would have oysters. Here's another question consisting of matching the nutrients on the left with the correct foods that are outlined below, trout, sweet red potato, uh, peppers, swordfish, wheat germ, etc. So pause here and align the correct foods with the correct nutrient. And I'll leave you with the answer in the next slide. Well, here's the correct answer. Vitamin E should be associated with wheat germ, vitamin K with collards, vitamin A with sweet potato, vitamin D with swordfish, vitamin C, red pepper, uh, vitamin B1, breakfast cereal, vitamin B6, chickpeas, and vitamin B12, trout. Next question, identify the magenta tongue symptom seen in vitamin B2 uh, deficiency or what we would call riboflavin deficiency. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is C, glossitis. Next question, identify the physician who wrote the first treaties on rickets back in the 17th century. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is A, Francis Gliffin. Next question, beriberi is the disease resulting from what nutrient deficiency? Pause here, select your answer. The correct answer is C, thiamine deficiency. Next question, identify the physician who documented pellagra preventative factor in a balanced diet. Pause here and select your answer. Well, the correct answer is A. Joseph Goldberger. What deficiency disease has symptoms of diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia, and death? The 4D symptoms. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is B, pellagra. Identify the cause of megaloblastic anemia. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is A. Because of folate deficiency, DNA in the cell cannot replicate, uh, causing the cell to grow in size rather than duplicate through a mitotic division. The result is a large red blood cell, or megaloblastosis. Next question. Identify below the correct interpretation of the expression folate fortification and supplements mask B12 deficiency? The correct answer is B. Folate supplements can rectify symptoms of folate deficiency that are also um, associated with B12 deficiency. However, however, the B12 deficiency, which is associated strictly with pernicious anemia, uh, goes undetected because there is an absence of megaloblastic anemia. Next question, identify the vitamin responsible for much of protein and amino acid metabolism. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is D, pyridoxin or vitamin B6. Next question, identify the vitamin that can be derived or synthesized from an amino acid. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is C. Indeed, niacin can be directly synthesized from the amino acid tryptophan with the help of B6 pyridoxin. What other deficiencies tend to be linked to vitamin A deficiency? Pause here, select your answer. The correct answer is B, calories, zinc, and protein deficiency tends to occur concomitantly with vitamin A deficiency. 
Next question. Identify below what might be a cause of vitamin B12 deficiency. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer, B, achloridia. This is the lack of acid that's produced from the parietal cells, usually after individuals have reached the age of 50. So it's typical in older age. This lesser, pro, this lesser uh, acid that's being secreted uh, makes that there is less release of B12 from the actual protein foods because the um, acid specifically uh, is very important for the breaking down of those protein foods. Next question, when an alcoholic suffers from thiamine deficiency, identify the disease that ensues. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is D, Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. Countries that consume abundant raw fish or sushi have a higher likelihood of becoming deficient in what vitamin? Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is D, thiamine. The enzyme thiaminase is the one that basically degrades the thiamine and it's found in the raw fish. Next question, what vitamin deficiency increases the risk of hemorrhaging since it plays a role in the clotting mechanism? Pause here and select your answer. Well, the correct answer is E vitamin K. Next question, identify the vitamin that is associated with the biochemical coenzyme FAD. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is A, riboflavin. FAD stands for flavin adenine dinucleotide. Identify the accurate definition of the symptom glossitis found in several nutrient deficiencies. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is D, bright red swollen tongue. Next question, pellagra was caused by what vitamin deficiency in the American South during the early 1900s? Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer, niacin. Next question. In starvation, what is the purpose of hepatic glycogenolysis? Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is C, to release glucose into the blood from the breakdown of glycogen. Next question. With the depletion of liver glycogen after 48 hours of fasting, what is the next biochemical process that ensures glucose reaches the brain? Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is E, gluconeogenesis. This is the step after glycogen has been depleted from the liver that ensures that through the breakdown of protein and other um, TCA metabolites, glucose can be formed. So it's a neogenesis, a new genes genesis of glucose from an unusual source, notably protein or amino acids. Next question. By the sixth day of fasting, what substrate is the brain significantly relying on for energy? Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is D, the ketones. After the reliance on um, blood sugars and on sugar to nourish the brain, the, the body transitions from the reliance on glucose to the reliance on fatty acid breakdown or lipolysis. The production of ketones are really just an incomplete metabolized fat or fatty acid. And these ketones are, have the ability to go through the blood-brain barrier and to nourish the brain instead of actually glucose. Next question. A 45-year-old woman weighing 89.34 kilograms with a height equal to 5 feet 7 inches is admitted to hospital for skeletal trauma, injury factor 1.3. Determine the patient's total energy expenditure. Pause here, pull out a calculator, a paper, and a pen, 
and calculate your answer. The correct answer is D, 2,530 calories per day. Now in order to do this, the REE equation that you see here then must multiply 1.2 activity factor, which is assigned to a patient being bedridden, and the 1.3 uh, injury factor that's indicated in the question. Next question, a patient weighing 197 pounds is admitted to the hospital burn unit with 40% BSA burn surface area, uh, is assessed and needing 3.2 grams per kilogram body weight of protein. Identify his protein need. Pause here, do your calculations, and select the correct answer. The correct answer is D, 286 grams. The answer is calculated as follows. First, you've got to convert the 197 pounds into kilograms. You do that by multiplying it by 0 0.454. That leaves you with 89.44 kilograms. That amount then is multiplied by 3.2 grams per kilogram. And the answer is 286 grams. Next question, what U.S. public health strategy was implemented in the 1930s to prevent rickets? Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is C, fortification of the milk with vitamin D. This occurred during the 1930s and 40s, whereas cod liver oil in the school was implemented as an early intervention uh, to help uh, control the development of rickets in young children during the 1920s. Next question, who was the English researcher who used a dog model of rickets to show that cod liver oil could prevent and cure rickets? Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is A, Malambi. Next question, identify which set of vitamins would be at risk of deficiency when there's an hepatobiliary disorder leading to fat malabsorption. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is A. E, A, and K. These are fat-soluble vitamins, and so consequently, if there is fat malabsorption taking place, these particular vitamins would have difficulty getting absorbed. Next question. Identify below the nutrient deficiency most likely associated with gastric bypass patients. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is B, vitamin B12 or cobalamin. This is because gastric bypass surgery bypasses significant number of parietal cells which secrete both hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor, and it's the intrinsic factor that is needed for the absorption of B12. Next question, what two-time Nobel Prize laureate proposed megadosing on vitamin C to cure the common cold? Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is D, Linus Pauling. He was a Nobel Prize laureate for peace and for chemistry. Next question, what vitamin is known to protect the polyunsaturated fatty acids or the PUFAs found in the phospholipid layer of the cell from free radical oxidation? Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is C, vitamin E. Vitamin E is indeed a fat soluble vitamin and it is an antioxidant and it finds itself in the cellular, uh, outer cellular bilayer a membrane uh, which protects cell integrity against the attack from free radicals. In international malnutrition, how would you define the economic development approach model for solving world hunger? Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is E. E because first it involves A, increasing the gross national product of a country will benefit the people economically and resolve the problem of hunger. That is certainly the economic model. But in addition, transitioning a country's agriculture from multi-crop to single-crop production benefits uh, the economy. 
Next question, identify the vitamins that have a clear neurological role. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is E, A and B. Think about thiamine deficiency related to beriberi, and remember that beriberi had clear neurological dege degeneration. Think about pyridoxin and its link with depression. And think about folate and its deficiency tied to neural tube defects. And think about vitamin B12 deficiency that is tied to pernicious anemia, which is really a um, neurological degeneration that leads to death. Next question, identify below why pellagra devastated the American South in the early 1900s. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is E, A and B. So it's A because the people in the American South, especially the poor, consumed a refined maize under the form of uh, cornbread. And then B, because the people consumed a protein-poor diet, a protein of poor biological value that was missing the essential amino acids. The most notable one is tryptophan. And had they been able to take tryptophan, uh, the tryptophan would have become niacin and this whole pellagra affair would have been avoided. Next question, identify below the nutrients that can potentially be involved in various types of anemias. Pause here and select your answer. Well, the correct answer is actually E. That's A and C. So folate and B12 both implicated in megaloblastic anemia, pernicious anemia. And then uh, we have C, riboflavin and pyridoxin both involved in hemoglobin synthesis. Next question, identify the vitamin that acts as a cofactor in the conversion of tryptophan to niacin. The correct answer is D, pyridoxin, or vitamin B6. Next question, identify the nutrient deficiency responsible for the greatest cause of mental retardation in the world. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is E iodine deficiency. Next question, what is recognized as the ideal molar ratio of calcium to phosphorus in order to favor maximal bone health? The correct answer is D. It's a calcium to phosphorus ratio of 1 to 1. And this minimizes um, calcium matrix uh, erosion or the loss of calcium in the urine. Both Wilson's disease and Menke's disease are linked to what nutrient? Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is C, copper. Next question. Based on your textbook readings, identify the significance of the acid-ash hypothesis. The correct answer is A. High intake of meat, of dairy, and processed foods adds... Uh, an acid um, phytate load that causes bone demineralization and increases the risk of osteoporosis. Next question, identify the accurate chemical name given to vitamin K. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is D, philoquinone. Identify the nutrients that have antioxidant properties. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is E, A and B, ascorbic acid and alpha tocopherol, which is vitamin E. These are two uh, certainly um, recognized antioxidants. And then zinc and copper are also part of the antioxidant mechanism in the body. Next question, identify the biochemical coenzyme that's linked to niacin. Pause here and select your answer. The correct answer is D, NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. This particular coenzyme is found throughout the TCA cycle. 